Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today we're going to do a two-color watercolor experiment using the Van Gogh brand Light Oxide Red and Da Vinci Ultramarine Blue. Um, we're going to paint in the wet and wet, fast and loose, tonalist style, and we're going to start by saturating our paper with water. While I do that, uh, two quick things. I guess it would be a um, trigger warning because that's kind of a sad thing. Um, so it's noon right now. I should be at work, but um, we've gotten a phone call this morning that my uh, fiance's father passed away. So we went over there. We helped the hospice nurse and then um, the people came and um, took him to bring him to, I guess, get cremated. Uh, but he's been suffering for a while, so there's that. The other thing is that um, Stuart Davies, who I paint in the style of, but with watercolor, his wife posted on his Facebook page that um, Stuart, Mr. Davies, is currently, I guess, at the doctor's in the hospital. I think maybe a heart valve thing. But she had posted on his Facebook page on behalf of him saying that he wished that he was uh, out and about painting with us uh, and painting on YouTube. So um, thoughts, prayers uh, to speed recovery for uh, to Mr. Davies. So I just wanted to get those two things out of the way. And just in case I sound a little bit off in this video. So I'm waking up. Let's get ready for work. And um, I thought she was talking to somebody in the other room. I was talking like in her sleep. I was talking to me. And I realized you know, it was a phone call from her mom. And, um, yeah, it feels like it's been a really long day, but it's only 12, 1 o'clock. Okay. That being said, now that the sad stuff is out the way, hopefully that didn't turn you off and turn you away. <laughs> with this two-color painting, I played around with just light red oxide yesterday. And just solely light red oxide. And there's a few interesting things with it. The light red oxide goes down more orange, but seems to dry um, redder. So there seems to be both a color shift and a tonal shift, a lightning that takes place whenever it dries. It also is a very warm color. Whenever I use light red oxide in a palette, I'll use it in combination with ultramarine, and I'll use it for my background trees, background mountains, um, to mix a purple. So here, I was thinking add ultramarine to this palette so that we can get a aerial perspective type color, a purple to push things back. And then from there, we can warm things up by pushing more towards the light red oxide. Plus it has an opacity to it that I think will layer nicely over a soft background. So I'm mixing up my ultramarine and my light red oxide. Unfortunately, I can't give you specific measurements, uh, percent of which, because there's so many variables involved. I told you about the brands that I'm using. However, beyond that, um, just the water concentration of the paper, the type of paper, uh, how much water I have on the brush, all those things play part in it. So we're going to make up an imaginary scene and you can see how purpley this is. We're going to push back and forth. I'm thinking that the light red oxide sky that I had gotten yes last night was really nice. So we may concentrate our light red oxide in this stage for the sky itself and then come back over with the purple as well. So the application process of this two color, I'm not quite sure of just yet. So this is a stronger light red. I'm not gonna wash the hake off at all. If I do, I will let you know. In fact, let me just get most of this paper covered. It'll go subtractive with it 
to create the sky and our tree line. Now with the paper towel, a few things. We're pulling back to the white of the paper, but if we vary our pressure strokes and movement, we can keep some pigment there and lighten things up further. We're pulling moisture out of these spots, so be aware of that in terms of wet and wet later on, and that we can come in and backfill with water if need be. Almost has a pastel -y type feel to it, the color. I'm not working from a photograph or anything like that. We're doing an imaginary scene. However, in regards to imaginary scenes, it's very easy to um, become, I don't know what the term would be, I guess redundant, uh, just constantly repeating the scene in various uh, shapes and forms. So I'm going to try to uh, switch things up. What can we do to switch things up? Mixing light red oxide and ultramarine. Let's put a grouping of trees in this location. On my drive to work, there's this one spot that I always want to paint, but I never paint it or get a photo of it. And there's these two tall, thin trees, or groups of trees on either side of the road. Now, I was thinking of something, I think Ray, Ray P, I'm just gonna use his last name. I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name. He had said that he was painting on location, or maybe it was uh, Joe, Joe Beatty, was painting on location and had turned a road into a stream, which is a perfectly fine thing to do. If you don't want a road element, which I personally am not the biggest fan of road elements, you can turn them into uh, stream elements or little um, dips and what have you. In fact, let's start outlining that now. As it comes closer to us, I'm going to make it wider so that we get that um, perspective taking place. I'm going to put a smaller grouping of trees on the further side, closer to the edge of the paper. This, I believe, would constitute a um, steel yard competition, uh, composition. Steel yard composition, if that's the correct term, is a big element towards the center of the paper, then a smaller element farther out uh, towards the edge. If you have a balance point right there, the heavier object has to be closer to the balance point than the smaller object. I believe that's the general idea of that compositional shape. So thoughts and ideas. The sky seems very natural. Um, I had mentioned that the light red oxide on its, on its own looked fantastic as a sky color. I think to be able to put that in and then get that separate cooler purple over top of it would be um, something to strive for. I always struggle with um, mixing ultramarine blue into on my palette, meaning that I would wind up getting larger concentrations of it. Some people enjoy that, some people don't. I'm not sure why that is. It might be because I'm using um, two different brands. Maybe the concentration of pigments different, so I'm mixing slightly different. But it's always seemed to take place.
Okay, so I'm mixing a stronger mixture. Maybe turn this into a little S-shaped composition where this ducks behind a little bit. Let me have a little S. So we swoop through. Size the S. We can bring that landscape across. It um, has an interesting glow to it in spots, especially around the tree edges where it hits a little bit of water. That seems to happen with uh, raw sienna as well. Build this tree up, bring it out to the side, and we'll have a mid-ground tree passing over those backgrounds. Now, I don't know if I mentioned, um, you are more than welcome to follow along with one of these paintings, too much ultramarine. And you are more than welcome to sign your own name to it. And you have my express permission to sell anything you do uh, from one of these videos. It's your painting. I want you guys to uh, be successful, build confidence. Um, if you want to give the painting away, that's fine too. If you'd like to support this channel, uh, down below, I have a few different uh, links for the Patreon. I do have some exclusive content on there. Uh, I do some early access stuff. I also have um, what Venmo Cash App if you ever want to support the channel. So I'd appreciate it. And if you don't want it, that's totally fine. Um, now I'm, I'm in the wet and wet stage still, so I'm going to play around. I have a card that I cut. Uh, one edge is sharp, one edge is naturally the way the card comes rounded, and the other edge is flat. With the sharp edge, if you scrape, you're going to get your dark lines and you're going to get your backfills. What's happening is you're damaging the paper, you're essentially scraping into it, and the pigment is filling back in. With the rounder edge, if you push a little bit harder, it's a little bit rounder, we can get a white line with it. So we're getting a variety of lines from one tool. And we get light and dark, and we're pushing in either direction. So we're kind of expanding that tonal range that's possible. I found with two color experiments, it's especially helpful if you're not having um, darks or super lights that you pulled out. Some other things you could do with the card, the flat edge is scraping rocks or wider tree trunks. Probably put some groups of trees right here. We could go ahead and do that now, but I think I'm gonna hold off. So the card, you can scrape trees, rocks. Um, you could do a whole bunch of the little dash marks to start creating a texture here. You could even do them more upright as if they're the tops of um, grass, ferns. So the card could be used for a lot of uh, elements. I think people also use their fingernail. I just haven't used my fingernail in the longest time in a painting. I want to bring down the shadows of this tree, the reflections of it. It's one of the cats playing in a bag. I'm going to go ask the cat to be quiet. Alright, so we're still wet and wet. 
And I'm going to take the number one rigger and I'm going to grab my pigment and paint in some trunks. This gives us some variety. It'll soften and lighten as it dries. I feel like I have painted this composition before. I'm not sure. What we can do is start creating a, I'm prepping for a big foreground element here. That'll change it from something I've done before. In fact, we can go back to the card I'm going to, instead of going flat so it's super wide, I'm going on an angle to shorten the width of it, scraping, and I'm going to pull out a big old tree right here, and use the flat round just to push, to create a secondary tree, and we can come up. I'm going to grab the number four just because of the thickness of it now and continue that tree up. A little bit of a counter change right there. Counter change is whenever an object is light over a dark background and then dark over the light background where it has that uh, transition take place. So this is just preparation, preparation for foliage here. And we could do a dry off to see our tonal shift. We'll get to that in a moment. I think this starts to create kind of a variation. Well, uh, we have the S shape here. We have our lines crossing. We have L shape, just a combination. And darken up this corner, or at least start to, to stop the eye from going off. So now we're gonna dry this. We're gonna see how it lightens up and how it shifts when the water's removed. So I'm going to pause that and just watch for when I turn, when it comes back on. All right, so drying, we get a nice soft effect. And you'll probably see why I use this for distant trees and distant mountains within a painting. And it just works so well with the soft uh, purple that we get. Now we're going to try to warm our next layer up and move more towards that light red oxide. So we'll start down in the front just to get a feel for how this is going to change things. What might work is rather than painting back to front, painting front to back where we have the strong concentration of pigment on the brush now, so it'll be the warmest. And then as we get back, we'll lighten things up. We'll mix in our um, ultramarine. I want some strong ultramarine here for dark shadows. That was one of the issues I was having with just the light red oxide was the shadows themselves. When I was originally using the light red oxide, I had thought maybe burnt umber would be a good mix for the shadows there. It may be worth, I do a lot of the two color and then three color painting videos. 
it may be worth it for us to start with one color, like the light red oxide, and then slowly expand to a full known palette. For example, the Ron Ransom palette was, um, I believe, light red oxide, raw sienna, burnt sienna, burnt umber, uh, lizarin, Payne's gray, lemon yellow, and ultramarine. Excuse me. And we can slowly start piecing those together. If that's something you'd like me to explore, let me know. That'd be a long-term video project, I think. So it would take a few videos to do, obviously. And it's the middle of November. November, what, 16th? So it's the start of kind of the holiday season. And um, just kind of preparing or for markets and stuff like that. Now to pay off all the art supplies. Okay. So, ultramarine blue, a uh, stronger mixture with the light red oxide. Right here, it has that purple gray feel already in the mix. So, let's see how this looks mid ground and how it interacts. I have my paper towel ready. To throw my texture back in because I don't want to just create one wash of color essentially or one wash of value I'm just pushing it back and forth let's throw it in on that water's edge I probably say this a lot, but in regards to painting, I think that texture and tonality are often the two important parts, especially to me. I think color combinations working together is just kind of a, it's a little, it's a Cajun phrase, a uh, lanya, uh, extra something. Okay, so we're warm in the foreground, but I want to warm up this tree foliage that's closer to us. So that's um, some strong light red oxide. Strong light red. Switching over to a rigger. They give us more control of mixing a dark. So a lot of ultramarine. I wonder if we should almost go pure ultramarine. Let's see how that looks. We're gonna take the chance. Let me know what you think and how you feel the ultramarine acts as the dark for this. Just make calligraphy type strokes. Uh, because of us using the hake here, we're going in and out of wet and wet areas. So some areas will um, spread out, some will create thin lines. But overall, it should create an interesting effect. And light source, let's say it's here. I just, all I do is take my brush and create a circle. And wherever that brush hits, that's where my shadows wind up going. 
just a cheap, easy way to get a little bit of perspective. For example, light source here, shadow for this tree would come out the direction that the brush winds up going. That means that this tree, this far object, would darken on that edge. There is a Dutch, Danish painter, Peder, who um, did really interesting tree paintings. Like, or just a really famous painter who would have that light source in the back and have the shadows come around the viewer. Very cool effect. Okay, pure ultramarine. stronger light red. I just couldn't bring it just yet. And this mix to interplay with that pure ultramarine. And it gives us a second variety of branch or a fourth or fifth since we scraped since we went wet and wet, um, just really builds up the density here. We're gonna have to come back in in a moment and do some foliage though. And of course, let me know in the comments, uh, questions, comments, um, your thoughts, what mixes you would like to see. If you would like me to slowly uh, explore developing a palette based off of this or presenting a known palette in this fashion, slowly building it up. Because I guess the point of these videos, especially the uh, two color and the one color, the monochromatic, is just to show you what can be done with just two pa um, tubes of paint. It helps you. Um, you know, just get started. So I'll flounder if there's too much color in a painting or too, many, too much color available on the palette. So let's pause this. We'll do a dry off. Okay. So during the dry off, while I was using the blow dryer, I was looking at it and I'm feeling that it's feeling a little bit weak. I'm trying to find the best words to describe why that means. Um, saying that maybe it's the splotchiness maybe it's the tonality um, so what I'm gonna try to do it seems like our mixture here of strong light red oxide pigment and strong ultramarine pigment gave a nice dark and I feel like maybe that dark will help start uh, grounding the painting more. That being said, I'm also thinking that this color palette combination would be great for a autumn feel, maybe with a subject matter that has less foliage in it. Potentially just using the mixture itself to maybe do a snow painting and then one or two quick splashes of pure light red oxide for where a little bit of brown growth would come through. Those are the ideas that are coming to mind as I'm looking at this and playing around. We could also use the light red oxide and the ultramarine mix as almost a drawing tool and start accentuating shapes as if we were to paint and then take a marker and bring things together. I 
think that's what's going to be done here. Almost a, um, I guess you'd say like an impressionist, expressionist type approach. Where light and area is totally fine. But I don't know if the painting has the uh, ability to hold its own yet. Creating a darker layer here, maybe as if we had a closer tree. Bring his shadow out, or her shadow. Are trees gendered? You know how flower, uh, flowers pollinate and stuff? I mean, are trees. I don't know. Hmm. That. Is something that I'm going to ask <laughs> my coworker, the one of the biology teachers, tomorrow. All right. Now the paper towel, on the other hand, if we don't like anything or if we want to vary it up. I'm getting pretty thick with the paint application now. I do want to here. coming out okay Hake strong 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 pigment I think these mixes rely on a heavier amount of ultramarine for the dark the light red oxide overpowers very quickly and then pushes it to that to the light red oxide so heavier application of ultramarine in the mix with lighter mix of light red oxide. I think that's, I think I started off saying I wouldn't give any formulas and I, I don't, but I think that is the formula that would be necessary. And simple experimenting will allow you to create that. I am getting some uncharacteristic uh, buckling of the paper. This is Stonehenge Aqua, which if you watch this channel, you know that I swear by it. So I'm not too sure why that's happening. We can do a few flicks of our number one rigger overlay over the foliage we just put in. And these videos, this one will probably go about 40 minutes, a little bit on the longer side, but you're more than welcome to um, stretch these out over a longer time period and have fun with it. This is mainly because of uh, restrictions of what you know people will will sit and watch and also how much real change you get I was thinking about a good analogy the other day where let's say you spent a minute a day practice singing you're not really gonna get good results but if you spend, I guess, 
30 minutes a day, you get good results. Hour a day, you get good results. If you're doing two hours, three hours, you're probably getting good results, but diminishing returns. So I think the same thing happens with fast and loose painting, where a 20 to 30 minute mark works good for me. And then there's a secondary mark of 40 to 50. Then maybe there's an hour and 20 where I see a difference. But diminishing returns, uh, more time being spent, but less uh, changes. And you'll find out what works good for you. For example, Alan Owen, he does a painting in about a 15 minutes, a minute, sorry, 12 minutes. If you watch him, and it sounds like, and it looks like it's easy, but his style is, he, he's mastered the art of um, the super fast and loose. Okay. Speaking of time, let's see where we're at. 36 minutes, let's pause this, we'll dry it off. All right, so I'm gonna do a few last minute things. Um, the first of which is just wetting something I play around with once in a while and splattering some water on top. This water will start loosening some of the pigment and then I'll take my paper towel and lift up those areas. So it adds a little texture, a little um, interest to it. Now, while I do this and while the pigment gets loosened, I will say a few things. This color combination, what it seems like is that if you want to get a dark, you have to get large quantity of ultramarine with a little bit of that light red oxide. Light red oxide will overpower it pretty quickly. That being said, the finished results seem like there is a uh, dichotomy, a, um, a pulling apart within the painting where we have that dark and then we have our light red oxide. I think this color combination excels for the initial wet and wet stage. Our background softness that we had take place. And on a secondary layer is where things felt like they were pulling apart and um, not really becoming harmonious, which I like texture and the dark over the light in the second layer, but it doesn't feel uniform in it. So it may require another approach, another playing with it to see what happens and um, see if this is a two colored combination that's worth painting in. But as of right now, it feels uh, separated. Let's throw some birds in. I'm wondering how uh, just a two colored would look as the underpainting and then switching palettes for an overpainting for the second stage. Okay, so we're all dried off. I'm gonna sign it. We, I'm gonna put up a 10 second frame at the end of this video for you to see what it looks like. I hope you enjoyed. If you wanna follow along, if you have any questions, comments, anything like that, message me, comment below or message me on social media. Um, let me know what you think, what you'd like to see. If you uh, want to share what you've done, um, tag me, hit me up. I'd love to see what you've done. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to y'all soon. Have a great day.